Welcome to Graham Kerr's Kitchen. It's really two programs in one. This is a series that appeals to your creative side. Food that is sumptuous stuff. How could that be? Uh, this is a program about people who want to eat healthy and reduce calories. Actually, it's about food with an aromatic quality that fills the nose. Oh, sure. But it's also about keeping my arteries clean by reducing fat. But it doesn't mean a thing if the food isn't rich and colorful. Maximize the flavor. OK, but I must have healthy food that I can cook in minutes. I must minimize the risk. So welcome to Graham Kerr's Kitchen, where we get our heads together just for you. I am absolutely thrilled. I know I have a tendency to say that just when we first get together, but I'm thrilled about this because I'm doing a very British program, and part of it is some parsnips which are steamed here in the pan, and these take 18 minutes to cook. So after they've been going eight minutes, then I put carrots on the second layer so that the whole lot then get finished in 18 minutes, but that just gives me just a perfect vegetable. I'm gonna mash that up at the end, come on through. What I'm gonna be doing is a pastry crust. Now, in Britain, pastry crusts are quite the thing. Everything is sort of covered in pastry. And those can be extremely high in fat. I mean, truly high in fat. We've reduced this by 50% in the fat and made it really within reach. If you love food wrapped in a little bit of flaky, tender pastry, okay. Well, and I need to introduce you to the lady with whom I have been relating during this. Actually, it is with Olga and Lenny and um, uh, Lundstrom, of course. And um, you rather gathered from that that Olga is Norwegian and Lenny is Swedish, okay? So they actually got together. And now they, they love to cook. I mean, they are real enthusiasts for wonderful food. Unfortunately, I'm, uh, how can we say it? Olga, you, you want to lose, how much is it? About 100 pounds? And, and it's tough going. And I understand that, that these things are not easy at all. But at least this is a contribution in the right way. We're going to work together. Will we, would you, can we do that? Work together? I'd like to be able to do that. And, and Lenny as well? OK, great. OK. Now, let me show you. Individual food preference list. Uh, Olga sent this in. Um, uh, we sent out 10,000 of these, and Olga sent hers back. She loves USA Southwest food and Italian and Northern European food. She likes to bake and roast, you know, roasting more than baking. Um, spare ribs feature high on her favorite food. And, oh, shame on you, darling. Macadamia pecan pie. I mean, that stuff is, you have a whisper, and you, you know, like that. As for seasonings, I love you. The lot, she says, everything. There isn't anything that you don't like. You use honey instead of molasses, but apart from that. Pork uh, is high up on your list, so we'll put some of that in it. Bing cherries when they're in season, I'm with you. And artichokes, ah, uh, aren't they terrific when they're in season? And pies. I happen to know that although Lenny doesn't like kidneys, you know, I mean, in dishes, um, that uh, you do. And so you sneak down to the English cafe and get one of those pies and come back and eat one and freeze another. Come on, I'll show you how to do this one. Come on. <laughs> As you know, always the whole principle here is to springboard off something, to do a, a technique and to say, well, I'll, I'll own that technique, but I'll put my own ingredients into it, just do my own thing. So that's a little bit what I did. I changed the classic British um, tiddy oggy, which is that pastry coated thing, and here's interesting stuff on pastry. First of all, I want the pastry to be tender. So in order to be tender, you'd wrap the flour proteins in oil. So I'm going to put two tablespoonfuls, this is just the technique, two tablespoonsful of oil into the flour and then begin to sift it. Well, it's not sifted, it's whipped. And you just whip it until it looks sandy. We'll do that a little later on, but that's, that's for tenderness, okay? Now, what about for flakiness? Because it isn't just a tender crust, it's also a flaky one as well. Well, for that purpose, you need to be able to go here. And straight out of the deep freeze, I want to be able to take a piece of fat. Now, this, is, this particular is a 70% calories from fat, um, vegetable oil, 
margarine, okay? And it will be sliced very finely. Again, we'll go into this one. But the flakiness of this, including the implements with which you cut it at the time, are solid frozen, really frozen, very cold. When it's cold, it means that the oil is going to stay, uh, that the fat is going to stay as pieces of fat and separates the layers of the pastry. So it becomes flaky. So warm and oil at the beginning to keep the protein in and then cold and fatty in order to keep the pastry apart for flakes. All right, that does it. The only other thing which I really should show you is these flours. Now, here, this is a whole wheat flour. And what the whole wheat flour and this unbleached flour, both made from hard wheats. And when the wheat is hard, then gluten forms. And you want gluten if you're making bread, but you don't want gluten if you're making a pastry like this. Because you want tenderness, and you want it to crumble apart from each other. You don't want it to hang on, which gluten does. So you can use this one. This is a pastry flour, which is like whole wheat, but it's much lighter and made from a soft wheat. And this one here, which is one I'm going to use, is a cake flour. And you can actually use that one perfectly with this dish. Okay, so there's the technique, a little bit of techniques on it. Now let's see how it gets on the menu. Today on Graham Care's Kitchen, smoked pork and apple titiyagi, a Devonshire pastry filled with smoked pork, apples, and mustard, and a carrot and parsnip cottage mash. Okay, Olga, Lenny, come on, let's have a go. I'm really thrilled about the fact that you liked the vegetable that goes with this, because this mashed parsnips and carrots are just fabulous. This is what happened. Um, they're on, of course, steaming at the present moment, as you know. But I put one pound each, for four people, of, of little parsnips like this, not larger parsnips like this one. This is a bit too big. Let's see how wide that is. Um, oh, how wide that is. That's about three inches wide. That's too wide. I think, for parsnip. About an inch, an inch and a half would be fine. And uh, they're scraped just the same as a carrot is, and then just chopped up roughly and thrown in, in, the, um, you know, in the steamer to do. And as you know, one uh, parsnips take just a bit longer than the carrots do. OK. Now, that's all happening, so let's look now at the flour. Now, here is a cup and a half, all right, of flour. Now, you don't have, this is cake flour, and you don't have to sift it as you measure it. It can be put straight in. Always sift cake flour for cakes, but you don't need to do it in this case. All right, now let's try the first part, which is to add the sugar to it. Now, sugar, oh, I did mention that earlier, but here I will mention it now for a very good reason. Now, let's assume for the present moment that, you know, go back in time to the sort of the greased hair. Now, we've got proteins in there with the grease over the top of it, which is going to keep those protein in, all right? Because I don't want to form gluten. All right. So we're at a dance, and, and, and here's a protein. It says, having this great time with sort of, sort of the greased hair style like this. But a little bit of the greased hair sort of falls forward, and right in the middle of this rock and roll number, notices this sweet little thing over here, just sitting demurely, minding her own business. Well, immediately he sees this. He breaks out. He just moves towards her and, and gestures to her, and she slinks up into his arms, and they begin tenderly to dance together. <sighs> they dance all night long. You see what happens is that the protein is attracted to sugar rather than the protein who is banging away at the time. This, um, this <laughs> uh, business of gluten all night. So he's having a gluten party. Instead of a gluten party, we have this tenderness, and that's the reason for the sugar. All right, send your cards and postcards if that isn't entirely <laughs> clear. All right, so that's doing well. So now in on top of that, we've got the fat. Remember, we've got to get cold fat. Now here, we've got a, literally a 50% reduction because you would put all of that in <coughs> and um, we're going to put half of that in. But with that half of the two ounces there of stick, we have two tablespoons, which is that extra ounce of oil. All right, remember we did it at the beginning? One, <laughs> two. Now, in goes the oil for the purpose of coating the protein. And when it coats the protein, rather like the slick um, hairstyle, you know, it, it stops the protein from getting out with the other proteins and forming gluten. And if it gets formed in gluten, it will be elastic and you'll be able to make good pasta out of it, and good bread out of it, and lousy pastry out of it. It won't be tender at all. All right, just stir that in together. See the little fine lumps? You can't wreck it. It is simple, 
That's the way it's done. Now, this is a little bit more complicated when we get into the hard stuff because it's got to remain cold. Now, I'm going to overdo this for you <coughs> so that you'll remember it. Uh, what you do is you take little bits of the fat and you literally chew it off into the iced water underneath. Now, why? I mean, isn't this going a bit too far? Well, probably it is. But I want to keep this fat as cold as it possibly can be. Whilst it was room temperature oil, it's got to be cold temperature fat. The reason, again, is so as to be able to separate clearly and absolutely the layers. That's what makes it flaky. We, we, we had a tasting of this a little while ago. And I'll tell you, this is one of the best pastries that I have ever tasted in my entire life. Now, it's not like, you know, the Volavon pastry, the, the French classic pastry, because the fact that's got a great deal of butter in it. But this one is incredibly interesting. Now, by simply putting that into there, now you just simply get a sieve uh, and then remove that and take out the bits. This is a bit awkward, and, and I think perhaps uh, I'm making it more difficult for you than you have to, but you could just simply peel the pieces of... <laughs> got so much ice here. Um, you peel the pieces... Thank you. Fine. Right, thanks. That means the parsnips are done. I can just move those to the side. So that's all done. And make sure you don't get extra ice cubes in there. And take this fat. It's very cold. And just drop that down now into the warm oil... All right, whipped pastry flour underneath, cake flour rather. Now, here's an interesting thing. You take this frozen uh, knuckle duster thing here, just um, put flour all over the top of it, and just simply rock that backwards and forwards. It's got little cutters on it. It's much better than the wire in the past. And everything is cold in order to keep the fat from going warm in it. This will give you the best flakiness that you've ever had in, in pastry. I mean, truly great stuff. All right, good. So that's been done. You see how that looks now, right down in there? Look, yellow sort of pea-sized pieces of fat. All right, now for the, uh, the water, liquid. A teaspoonful of vinegar. Please write to me if you know why. We have done considerable tests on this one, and the vinegar helps, but we don't know why. It's just an extraordinary experience. We do know that it's got to be cold, um, but we don't know why the vinegar. Huh? Uh, so what, just write to me. One, two, three, four. Four teaspoonfuls of nice cold water in the top there, and then just shoot that around. Um, if it's really ice cold water and everything is really ice cold, it'll work wonderfully. Now, stir it all up together, and about this stage, you're going to say to yourself, this is too dry. I need to add some more liquid. Resist that, please, at all costs. <laughs> because the most extraordinary thing is about to happen. You, you just take this up and see how flowery that is? No, just put it down here. And, and you just look at that and you say, oh, no, Graham, come on. That's not right. <laughs> you wait and see. Now, you just take all of that, all, all dry and crumbly, and you notice what I'm not doing. Hot hands, cold heart, what do they say? Warm hands, cold heart, I don't know. All, all's fair in love and war, um, and all those sort of things. But what they say about pastry hands is if you've got warm hands, then it's going to warm up the fat, and that doesn't make good pastry. Well, what I'm going to do here is just take that film and make a package of that. Just put it together, like so, See that now? Now, I just move that into a round ball, and then that goes into the fridge for just 10 minutes. Extraordinary. And 10 minutes, it's going to look just like that. It's just amazing. The, the liquid content in it spreads out and absorbs itself into the flour. You can then mold it just a little bit, and you'll be ready to go. All right, one thing quickly. Um, and we've been doing this a little bit here and there, and I just thought I'd just show you once again because it's so desperately British. A couple of mint leaves, about a quarter of a cup of boiling water on the bottom, a tablespoonful of brown sugar, and a cup of cups of peas, all right? Just dumped onto the top. And uh, put that on the side, 
and just keep that to the side of the pan, you know, just two or three minutes. Mm, minted peas, just lovely, nice sweet taste to them. All right. Now, this um, pastry board here, I, or this board, I have so I can cut things and then I've got little uh, groove so that I can spill liquids down into the thing, get it off the cup, all that sort of stuff. But it's blank on the other side, so useful in a, you know, to keep an uncluttered kitchen. Um, so here is the pastry, still very cold and keeping it cold. A little bit of flour here, just put it on the top. Um, that on the top there and a little bit more flour on the top there. Now, um, this is enough for four or a, a whole pie if you wanted to coat a whole pie. And I'm going to cut that into four pieces. And that should be enough to be able to make a little bit of um, uh, a round piece in order to be able to make the classic shape of Tiddy Oggy. Uh, Tiddy Oggy is a, is a name for Cornish pasty, which comes from England. And um, that is a, something which is slipped into the back pocket by the, the um, Cornish or Devonshire miner. Actually, the Cornish miners would put it into a lunch pail because they could afford it. They used to mine tin, and uh, the Devonshire chaps used to mine um, coal, so they would put it in their back pockets, and the Cornish chaps would have their, you know, ordinary lunch pail. I just thought you'd like to know that. But rather nice feeling to sort of set out on a cold, frosty morning with a warm tiddy oggy in your back pocket. In fact, two tiddy oggies, you know, the sort of new bun warmer. Um, so here is a, uh, just um, um, about a six inch, kind of somewhere here, oh good, a six inch bowl, uh, and uh, just roll it out until it's about seven inches long, and that should do fine. And then lift it up, and you have the basic ingredients to be able to do that. You should be able to get um, four, if not five, out of this mix. It takes about three ounce fillings. All right, here's the filling. Now, the filling is really quite interesting. <coughs> I've got um, four ounces, and that's a, a, a Braeburn apple, if you're interested, diced and not cooked in any way. Four ounces, which is a small sweet potato, just cut in small dice, like the same size as the potato, uh, as the tomato, as the, <laughs> as the apple. <laughs> I got it on the third go. And, um, and those are slightly cooked, just a little steamed, first of all. And then a couple of teaspoonfuls of French mustard. That stuff that you knock on a rolls for. And here, this is the smoked loin of pork. All right? Now, you've seen these now. They're all over the place in the supermarkets. Usually a shrink wrap thing and sort of three to a package for some reason. Well, there's four ounces here, and those have been diced up into exactly the same size. All right? So all we need to do is just to give those a little bit of a stir around so as to mix the uh, peppery, mustardy, combination with the, with the apple and the sweetness there. Can you imagine what that tastes like? And just a little bit of freshly ground black pepper in there too. It just gives it a bit of a sparkle. Now, Olga suggested um, Polish sausage in there. And uh, yes, darling, a um, little bit fat. And I haven't been able to find a lower fat one that I could guarantee people across the country so far. So I'm um, just going to stick with this for the moment. And um, a little pastry brush and 2% milk. Just anoint the edges around the outside so that you've got that, so that you can pour it over. And just push it to, like so, seal it up together. And you can actually squeeze this together with your thumb and forefinger as you go around. Or you could use a fork, uh, which the other ones have been done. Then just 2% milk again over the top, just like so and just lift that up. In fact, I'd probably do that before I put that there. And these have been done a little while before and they're showing through, but that's exactly the same as those, four of them, okay? 425 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the best temperature to be able to get that flake going because it needs that high temperature. And then they come out and they look gorgeous, just, just like that. You can hardly wait to get at them. Plate, hot plate, and we're almost there. Now, the mash that takes place, which is really important, is what we started on in the beginning, uh, is to here. You just take the carrots and drop those in to the bowl like so. 
and then they must be freshly cooked. And then the parsnips on top, 50-50, okay? And then with a sort of pogo stick idea, and a little bit of pepper, you just crush them. Now, they're not crushed um, until they're a sort of rather like a mash, I mean a total mash, they should be roughly done, all right? And there's the pepper, all right? And just a little touch of nutmeg, truly. I, I know, you might not have tried this, but try a whole nutmeg, a little grater like this. Just, just a little, just, just a touch to begin with. <laughs> and then back into that to be able to mash it all up. Good. Now, you just take a hold of one of these or slip it into your back pocket, whichever you want. And um, just there, um, a good scoop of that mix and it is just fantastic stuff. And then the peas have come up to the boil here with the mint on them. They're perfectly wonderful and can hit the plate. Try and keep it to that portion size. And what a British meal come through. Now, you remember, actually, as I was uh, doing that, that I was saying that, you know, the Cornish one was, uh, was a, a torpedo shape. Well, this is the Cornish one here. This was the style of one that I did years and years ago, the Galloping Gourmet, and this comes out of the classic book of the complete galloping gourmet, and so I will now compete with myself. Um, this was my original one, 1,369 calories. Whoa, Graham, 475, that's more like it. Fat, 78 grams of fat. This is down to 13 only. 40 grams of saturated fat in that, down to only two, much better. That was 51% of calories and fat. This is now down to 24%, quarter. And then that cholesterol was uh, two-thirds of the day. That's down to only 15. Sodium was 1,300. 753, still a little bit high for me. And then carbohydrate, 77. Oh, I mean, that's a whole lot different, isn't it? Now, this would be eaten just like this, out of the back pocket. Um. Oh. Mm. That takes me back to my youth. I took too large a bite. Forgive me talking with my mouth full, but that's the way it has to be. Um, it is delicious, flaky, tender, just about as wonderful as you can imagine. Now, chuck your own ingredients into that and have fun. And don't forget when you do, it's called springboarding. Well, <coughs> uh, just in exactly the same way as we've been doing in going the extra meal, is where you do just a little bit more than you normally expect to do uh, in terms of what you need, you know. Hey, you could do a dozen of those, and just the same as Olga, who nips down to the English uh, cafe and comes back with a little pie and then freezing it, what I'd like to ask you to do is when you've got that made to the place before you put it into the oven, wrap that tightly in, you know, just as this was wrapped tightly, and put it into the deep freeze straight away. And then you'll be able to reheat those, um, you know, to actually put them into the oven and bake those at 425 degrees Fahrenheit. That'd be wonderful. The other way that you could do, in order to allow yourself a little bit more flexibility, is when you've made the pastry, make more pastry. And for this, you're going to have to employ just an unusual technique. And that is that you just simply take a piece of, of um, here, cardboard. You know, this is perfectly reasonable cardboard. And then you just put that on a piece of wax paper on top of the cardboard and slide that out. Now, that is a completely frozen disc ready for a pie top. And what I would do with that is I would have also, you know, in the deep freeze, some a casserole dish that I'd used before and think, hey, wouldn't that be nice under a pie crust? And then just put the pie crust on the top, um, melt it all down just to be able to press it down here, anoint the outside with a little bit of um, milk and then pop that into the oven, all right? Again, at 425 degrees Fahrenheit. It'll do very well. Matter of fact, it'll do rather like this one here. Um, this is exactly the same. It was a beef stew, and I did one a little while ago. It's a hearty beef stew. We put it in the deep freeze, and, um, and then we just sort of uh, thought we'd put a pie crust on the top of it, and it is so tender and flaky, so tender. I mean, it is really... You know those marvelous things that you remember, that tender, flaky crust as a child? And um, grandma's apple pie or whatever it may be. But well, this is, of course, a savory pie. 
And um, I just want to taste a little of that. It, it comes out beautifully. It cuts nicely. It is so tender and flaky. Uh, <laughs> a few kidney pieces in there, Olga. Mm? And you know what we'd have? Almost the same as you get from that, uh, from the English cafe. But instead of the English cafe um, crust, which would have about four uh, ounces of, uh, of fat, definitely more than this one, you're really going to be down on this. Mm, a lot better. So you've minimized the risks, picked up the flavors a little bit, and boy, feels good. Okay, done in flash. God bless. Now, don't forget Olga, Lenny, let the protein dance with the sugar, okay? And you'll get some tenderness in there, and they won't have so much gluten. Got to stop this gluten business amongst the young people. <laughs>